Numerology is a study of numbers and the mystical relationship between a number and one or more coinciding events. The idea is that there's a significance in numbers, that some are lucky, some are unlucky, and in the case of some, they're downright evil. In 1997, there was a book called The Bible Code that claimed that within the Bible, there was a hidden code that could be deciphered to predict certain world events. Under scrutiny, it seemed, the author did a lot of cherry-picking to prove his theory. Many people think numerology has a lot to do with apophenia, which is the propensity for your mind to fill in certain blanks and find familiarity. This is why we see objects in clouds, or Jesus in toast. Numerology makes for great fiction, because the writer can take the numbers to mean whatever the story requires. Pi is a movie about a brilliant mathematician who uses numbers to uncover the meaning of existence. In the number 23, Jim Carrey discovers that all aspects of his life, in some way, have to do with the number 23. According to The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is 42. In the 2009 film Knowing, a numerical message from the past is a warning for the future. In the early 2000s, a writer named Ryan Pearson met with some producers. He pitched his idea of a time capsule from 50 years ago being opened, and within it was a series of predictions, all of which up to that current time had come true. The producers immediately bought the script and spent the next few years getting it adapted to film. The movie is to be a mixture of science and faith, a search for meaning in the universe. In order to talk more in depth about the film, I need to go into some spoiler territory. So I highly recommend you check the movie out and then come back. Director Alex Proyas came on board because he liked the idea of someone seeing into the future but had no control over it. After reading the script, Proyas knew he wanted Nicolas Cage for the lead. One of the things he liked about knowing was that it was a very personal tale of the end of the world. It's actually a good three quarters of the way into the film before he even discovers it's about the apocalypse. The director wanted to earn the audience's suspension of disbelief. He wanted to make the events as plausible as possible, so when they transitioned into the supernatural elements, the audience was already on board. Director Alex Proyas had always dealt with heavy themes of life and death in his films, from The Crow to Dark City and even iRobot. Proyas read a lot of 50s sci-fi growing up, which was during what is often called the Atomic Age. It was a time that developed everything from television to the atomic bomb. Many of the sci-fi stories to evolve from that time were loaded with visions of what the future could be, as well as the fear that there might not be any future at all. After detonating nuclear bombs in the 50s, that was when the first sightings of UFOs began. Many people think it was our discovery of the power of the atom that brought about the attention of aliens. Can you see or measure an atom? Yet you can explode one. A ray of sunlight is made up of many atoms. So what if we do develop this solarite bomb? We'd be even a stronger nation than now. Stronger. You see? You see? Your stupid minds. Stupid. Stupid. The movie was also inspired by the Heaven's Gate cult, a group founded in the 70s that committed mass suicide in 1997 to escape the Earth on a passing comet, which they believed was really a UFO that would take them to a new world. The word apocalypsis refers to secrets about the end of the world that are hidden in symbolic language or code. So it's an interesting take on that by having the end of the world predicted with numerology. The focus of the story is to be about the damaged relationship between a father and his son. The father's thrown into an event that shakes the very foundation of his beliefs. Cates plays MIT professor John Kessler, who's still dealing with the loss of his wife. He believes that there's no grand design in the world, and that everything is random. That is until he deciphers the paper from the time capsule that had the dates and death tolls of hundreds of disasters over the past 50 years. Caleb, John's son, has been getting messages from the strangers, mysterious silent people who are warning him about the end of the world. John reaches out to Diana, whose mother was the one who wrote the note 50 years ago. They discover her daughter Abby's also been hearing the voices of the strangers. Lucinda who wrote the original code, was driven mad by the voices and by the fact that year after year she was seeing the events transpire and yet could do nothing about it. Not even her family believed her. She finally killed herself because she knew the world was ending anyway. John realizes he has no control over the events and the only way to save his son is to let him live on off the planet. Preuss disliked how so many apocalyptic films always ended with the hero figuring out a way to stop Armageddon. With this, he wanted it to be unstoppable. I thought there was some purpose to all of this. Why don't I get this prediction if there's nothing I can do about it? The movie was about facing the inevitable, not about preventing disaster. Even though the movie ends with everyone else dying in a ball of fire, the message is about hope. It's about the fact that future generations will continue on after our death. It's about the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. Even though the movie focused on the story of Caleb and Abby leaving Earth, you can see there's hundreds, possibly thousands of others. They're just one of the many groups of Adam and Eves being dropped off on the planet and heading towards the Tree of Knowledge to start the new world. 
The movie has religious elements to it, but it's not a religious movie. It's just using themes and imagery from the Bible as a device to tell the story. The engraving from Ezekiel was showing the chariot of the gods, which they replicated in the end. The strangers transformed into what could be seen as angels, so it's left up to the audience as to whether they're aliens or angels. I've seen arguments for both. The movie drops all sorts of hints about the end of the film. From John talking about life on Earth, in accordance with our distance to the sun, the background chatter about the solar flares, and Caleb's vision of seeing the world on fire. On the board in John's class is Maxwell's equation of electromagnetics. The Earth's magnetosphere is what shields us from the sun's radiation. The movie was shot in three months for about $50 million. The scene where they buried and dug up the time capsule 50 years later was actually shot just a few days apart. They filmed the first part to look like the 50s, and then the art department redressed it by weathering the set and adding bigger trees. They then shot the scene in current times just a few days later. Laura Robinson had a dual role as Lucinda and Abby. The paper with the predictions was accurate. The events are all listed correctly in order, along with the death toll, with the exception of the fictitious ones, of course. Preuss envisioned the plane crash scene by one continuous take. The complexity of having it be real and CGI made it even more difficult. They filmed it over seven days in Melbourne, Australia. There was a partly built highway that they got the okay to use. After every take, it took three to four hours to reset. After many times of trying and failing, they didn't get the shot until the last day of the shoot. Early in the film, in Nicolas Cage's class, is Liam Hemsworth in his first role. In an earlier cut of the film, they had more with the strangers, but they edited those scenes out to make them more mysterious. The destruction of the Earth by solar flare is grounded in reality, but admittedly, the filmmakers took some artistic license to make the ending more grandiose. The isolated house is symbolic of Nicolas Cage's character. He's purposefully cut himself off from the outside world. The inside of the house is in a state of disarray. He was in the process of remodeling it when his wife died, and hasn't done anything since. The movie is not religious propaganda. It's science fiction that chose to use symbolism of theology. There is Christian imagery, but it's no different than having something like Neo or Superman as Christ-like. Actually, it's probably not as heavy-handed. It leaves the audience to decide what to make of it. It doesn't spell things out or insult their intelligence by over-explaining it. The strangers are never called aliens or angels in the film, but they're seen as what's called the Nordics, a form mainly tied to European UFO sightings. They appear as tall, silent, Caucasian men. The people who've reported contacts with the Nordics have stated that they show concern for the Earth's environment and project their thoughts telepathically. While the movie's often dismissed as religious propaganda, I didn't see it as such. Movies like Stigmata and the Prophecy have much heavier religious themes, yet most people enjoy them for what they are, good movies. They're all fiction, pure and simple. Not everything that has a religious angle has to be some sort of indoctrination device. You can take away from it what you like. I just see it as a well-written, well-directed film with religious themes starring Nicolas Cage about the end of the world. Not to be confused with the poorly written, poorly directed film with religious themes starring Nicolas Cage about the end of the world. <laughs> Spencer, tell me something about the sun. It's hot. 